the moon creates the most gorgeous set of vistas as it rises over the ocean. But what it also does is it exerts a gravitational influence on the earth and that gravitational influence causes the tides. Wherever you have gravity, you also have tides. But this is fantasy. What happens if you have multiple moons? What is the effect on your world's gravitation, its ties, its people, its fauna and flora, even its calendar? That is what I want to talk about today. Welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If you've not yet done so, please do hit the subscribe button down below. And if you want to join my community of world builders, there is a link to the Discord server down below as well. Okay, let's get cracking with moons and tides. First, you have to understand how tides in our world work. What happens is the moon exerts a gravitational force on the earth, which causes the oceans to bulge as they are pulled towards the moon. Now, as the earth rotates, it goes through the high tide and low tide effect as it moves through that bulge. Okay, cool. But how does spring tide and neap tide work? So, these are not actually caused by the moon. They're caused by the sun and its alignment with the moon. So, when you have spring tide, what happens is the sun the earth and the moon are all aligned. This is called sagia. I might pronounce that wrong. And it's when all three bodies are aligned or when a number of celestial bodies are aligned. What happens in this case is the bulge is exacerbated as all of the gravitational forces are working in a line. When the sun and the moon are at right angles to each other, in other words, at the half moon points rather than the full moon and new moon points, you have neap tide because the gravitational waves of the two celestial bodies actually cancel each other out. And that's when you have the smallest difference between high tide and low tide as opposed to the largest difference between high tide and low tide that you experience during spring tide. So what happens if you add additional moons? Well, the first and most obvious effect is that you can have multiple bulges. So you could have a situation where you experience more than two changes of tide in a given day. But what you also have to consider is that when your celestial bodies align, the resulting spring tide, the resulting strength of the bulge, is going to be enormous. You could potentially have a difference between high tide and low tide that runs 20, 30, 40 meters of sea level. So what could happen is that once during a lunar rotation cycle, or twice during a lunar rotation cycle, you could end up with entire patches of ocean opening up and having access to land that is normally quite deep ocean. And conversely, you could have entire patches of the earth drowning. So you would have to build your cities quite far from the land in that case. Because as the oceans rise for that enormous spring tide, you have this wave of seawater that could potentially rise up to 20 meters and drive your cities far inland, far away from the actual ocean. So it could have quite a fundamental effect on your coastline to have multiple celestial bodies exercising their gravitational forces on the ocean of your world. It could also, rather than multiple bulges, result in a more spread bulge. So your tidal movement between high and low could be longer and more spread out. But I think the biggest, most 
fundamental change that's going to happen if you have multiple moons is that your spring tide is going to be dramatic. But spring tide only happens when the bodies all align. If your bodies have got right angles to each other, even if one or two is just out of alignment with the rest who are at right or who are aligned, you're, you might still experience a reasonable tide, a neap tide. So in a world like that, if such alignment of your moons is a very rare occurrence, like say it's a once in a decade occurrence, then people could potentially build their cities close to the ocean and be aware that once every 10 years there is this event for which they then dig ditches to absorb the water and cycle it back into the ocean or potentially they have massive tidal pools that allow the water to wash in and hit the lagoons where they then slowly seep back into the ocean once the ocean retreats. So I could see a multiple moon world having a normal coastline except for these alignment events and then these alignment events driving certain sentient settlement behavior like where your cities are, how you protect your cities or settlements from these massive tides and potentially even travel routes. Like if this is for example a predictable say once a month thing that you have these huge tides, you could create trade routes where people go to a designated spot and then when the ocean opens as you have this retreating ocean due to the tide being so low and there being you know 20 meters worth of sinkage in the ocean you could have a route that opens for three or four hours that people then rush, rush, rush their trade caravan through in order to reach the other side so as to avoid ocean travel. I think that would also be a very interesting side effect of multiple moons if they align often. So really, with multiple moons, the question is how often do they align? If you're going to build multiple moons into your setting, you're going to need to chart them the way that we have tidal charts. So you're going to need to say, okay, I have three moons as an example, and this moon rotates this fast, that moon rotates so fast, that moon rotates so fast, and the entire thing rotates around its primary star this fast. And then work out from there, how often do you experience alignment of the celestial bodies? And how often do the waves of the gravitational forces of the other moons cancel each other out so you have what amounts to neap tides? Do you mostly have neap tides with just once or twice an alignment event, which then has this dramatic impact? I think that multiple moons is a great way to work with your tides in that effect. And I think that you can make some really fundamental natural forces by using multiple moons. If you enjoy talking about celestial bodies, their alignment, their impact on tides, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about the impact that tides have on sentient species and their settlements. While I was doing research for this video, one of the very interesting snippets of information that I came across is about tidal streams. Tidal streams is places where the tide pushes huge volumes of water in between rocks and so on, and it starts running at a high speed, forming what amounts to rivers running through the ocean. So it's basically pushing huge volumes of water, creating streams in the ocean. The one that I came across that was really interesting is called Lara Falls, and it is in Scotland. And what made it so interesting was the volume of water and the strength with which it flows and the white water effect that you get there. So there are people who go to Lara Falls to kayak there and to sort of test themselves against that element. That brought to mind, for me at least, that it would be very interesting to have a coastal community that has a manhood ritual around 
traversing such a tidal stream. So it made sense to me to have a coastal community where in order to prove that you're an adult, you have to build a kayak and then take that kayak and sail through such a tidal stream. And if you had multiple moons, it would also then make that a more spectacular adulthood ceremony if you have to wait for the celestial alignment to happen and then you make it through in your kayak. Or maybe you could have a race when the celestial bodies align and everybody has to build their own kayak and make it through these incredible tidal streams caused by this very, very high tide. So I thought that would be a very interesting human ritual aspect to incorporate into a world with high tides and tidal streams. The other interesting snippet of information that I came across is that there are some nations where there is fishermen who fish from poles. Specifically, I saw this in Sri Lankan videos where they plant poles during low tide. So they go quite deep into the ocean during low tide and they plant these big poles that have got horizontal crossbars where the fisherman then climbs onto and sits on the pole. And then when the tide comes back in and brings some fish, they can cast their lines from there and they can sit on these poles during the entirety of the tide and fish from them. And apparently this is more effective than fishing just from the beach, and it is also more effective than potentially sitting in a boat. That, I thought, was a very interesting fishing mechanism, and again, tied to your tides. If you want to specifically take a look at an example of a city that handles tidal incursions really well, it is worth looking at Venice. So in 2018, with rising sea levels, Venice experienced a tide that was so high, the pumps couldn't keep the city clear of water. There's footage showing people who are eating pizza while Venice is flooded. They're running the 2018 marathon in Venice and running in the water because they just could not keep the sea out. So now they're busy with a project of building massive floodgates in order to protect Venice from such a high rising tide. So if you're looking for ideas on how to keep the tide out of a city if, they, if it's experiencing extreme tides in your world, it's worth taking a look at Venice's management of high tides. The other aspect of tides that I haven't seen many people consider, use or think about is how tides affect generation of power. Now, of course, you could say, but that just applies to a modern setting, but it doesn't. We have had flour mills that have been driven by tidal power for at least 800 years. So what happens is you have a pool that fills up when the high tide comes in and pushes the water up into the pool. As the water drains out of the pool, as the tide goes out, that drainage becomes kinetic energy that you can let flow over a water wheel that generates the power to run a flour mill. Much the same way as a water wheel driven flour mill would do in a river, but maybe you don't have a river and the tide can then provide the power to drive your flour mill. This would be especially interesting if you had a Venice-like city where you have massive incursions of tides and then you have these huge lagoons that allow for these water wheels, multiple water wheels, to drive multiple mills, potentially, if you have electricity in your world, to drive electricity generation through the conversion of kinetic energy from these water mills in this lagoon area. On planet Earth, we're experimenting with creating electricity from the tidal energies. So there are two ways of doing this currently. The one is tidal barrage, which is where you have a lagoon that fills up and then as the water drains, the kinetic energy is converted into electricity, much as I spoke about now with the water wheels. The second is a more high-tech solution, 
where you take a, a generator with blades and you put it into an actual tidal stream. And as the tide flows past the blades, those blades create kinetic energy, which is then converted into electric energy and which is then a green method of generating power. It is currently too expensive to utilize at a large scale, especially when compared to things like wind generation and solar generation. But there's a lot of potential in it and a lot of good research going into making it cheaper. So we'll see, maybe someday soon, we too will have power generated from the tides. I should also speak about magic and multiple moons. And for that, I think we should talk about the magic of Kryn that classic D&D world brought to us by Margaret Vase and Tracy Hickman. On the world of Kryn, there are three kinds of magic users. Black robes, the evil guys, white robes, the good guys, and red robes, the neutral guys. Now, each of these magic users draw their power from one of the moons of Kryn. The black moon that can only be seen by black robes, the white moon that everybody sees, and the red moon that occasionally rises. So what is interesting about the way that Kryn does this is that each moon is actually representative of a god. So the magic users are in fact drawing on the power of the gods they worship, but it's not like a cleric who prays to the god. It's a more direct kind of drawing on the power of the god. Making a moon god is something we have done as humans for a very long time. So it makes sense that in your world, there would also be gods associated with multiple moons. It would then make sense to tie either your divine magic or your normal magic, if you have both sorts, to the moon and its variations. You could also draw on the moon and its kind of tidal power to build the ebb and flow of magic. Maybe magic is more during high tide and maybe it's less during low tide. Maybe when the celestial bodies align and you have these massive tides, magic users have got enormous potential power to them. And maybe when it's really low tides, they've got less available. Or maybe it's about how much kinetic energy there is in the tides and magic users can draw that kinetic energy out of the tides and use it. If you liked that discussion of the power available in tides and how that can affect your settlement and potentially how that can affect your magic system, hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about fauna and flora, both fantastical and normal, in a tidal situation. The green turtle, as an example, waits for high tide to carry them up as far as it can onto the beach where they were born. They then crawl forward on their flippers, dig a hole and lay their eggs. Then they return to the water as the sun rises. Now, quite often at that point, the tide's gone out. And if they then get stuck anywhere, like they're going over rocks and maybe they get trapped in a rock, then they have to wait for the tide to once again rise to cover the area where they got stuck in so that they can swim back into the ocean. Mangroves, for example, are home to monkeys who go and feed when the tide is out. So they go and feed on all the things that were left behind as the tide pulls out of the mangrove they go and eat the clams and all the little insects and crabs and whatever that are left behind. And then when the tide rises, the monkeys flee into the trees and, you know, go, go deeper on land again. But there are crocodiles in the mangrove swamps who have become quite good at setting ambush points. And any monkey who lingers too long in the mangroves is likely to become a snack to the crocodiles who've become adapted at being both salt and freshwater crocodiles. Fiddler crabs also use the low tide to 
scavenge for various food. And it's also when they do that mating dance of theirs with their huge claw. And then the successful male and the female go together and they go do the devil's tango down in a hole while the unsuccessful fiddler crabs walk around with their blue crab claw. So it's very interesting to see how these animals are adapted to the tidal effects around mangroves, which are so rich in food when the tide pulls out, and then when the tide comes back in, it brings with it sharks and all of these other sea animals that then start looking for anything that wasn't fast enough to escape the rising tide. And that is a very rich breeding ground for building in some additional fantastical animals that could be adapted to your magic system. Maybe, going back to the idea of using the tides as a source of power for magic system, maybe you have fantastical animals that can utilize the exiting tide or the entering tide to naturally use the magic inherent in your world to either hunt or protect themselves or potentially to breed or to create homes for themselves. So definitely worth thinking about the effect of tides on your fauna and flora in your world. And if you enjoyed that little side note on fauna and flora and the tides, hit the thumbs up button. One strange thought about having multiple moons on your planet. The moon slows down Earth's rotation around the sun. It actually pulls it back a bit because of the gravitational forces it exerts. That's why we have leap seconds that add up to leap years. That means that if you have multiple moons, they're probably going to slow down your planet's rotation around the primary by quite a bit. So you might end up in a situation where your calendars get quite out of date the way ours used to before the implementation of the leap year where we've got an extra day once every four years. So it's worth thinking about how much the various celestial bodies retard the cycle of your planet around the sun and how your civilizations deal with that in their calendar accounting. Do they have leap years often? Do they adjust for it on an ongoing basis? What do they do to manage the retardation effect on their years? And that is my thought on tides, fantasy and multiple moons. If you found this video interesting, you might want to check out my Under the Sea Civilization video or any of the other videos on my channel. And if you want to help me make more of these videos, there are links down below to my Ko-fi page and to my book, which you can buy to support me in my work in making this channel. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time World.